Welcome to the second session of this year's Brown Bagger webinar series brought to you by the National Beef Cattle Evaluation Consortium. The theme of this year's webinar series is National Cattle Evaluation Charting a Course for Continued Genetic Improvement. If you haven't visited the NBCEC website, I encourage you to do so. Uh, this is where we house uh, recordings from previous Brown Bagger sessions. So if there's a talk, unfortunately, that you miss or you'd like to go back and review, uh, you can do so here. I'm your host today, Matt Spangler. I'm a faculty member uh, at the University of Nebraska in our animal science department and in our breeding and genetics group. Uh, myself, along with my colleagues, Bob Weber at Kansas State and Dare Bullock at the University of Kentucky, uh, are the organizers of this Brown Bagger session, and we certainly appreciate your participation in it. So we have uh, two talks today, uh, both centered on beef cattle uh, adaptation. The first by Dr. Mike McNeil of Delta G, uh, and he's gonna talk about how we can utilize genetic by environmental, environmental interactions as it relates to national cattle evaluation. And the second from Dr. Jared Decker at the University of Missouri uh, that will give us an update on a USDA funded project centered on adaptability. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Mike McNeil. Uh, and Mike, I'll go ahead and, and transition this control over to you as I introduce you. Um, our, our first speaker today, I'm sure uh, not a stranger to this group, uh, Dr. McNeil received a bachelor's degree from Cornell, a master's degree um, from Montana State and his PhD in breeding and genetics from South Dakota State. For the first uh, eight to nine years of his career, he worked as uh, a statistician and research animal scientist at uh, US Mark. And from there, he transferred to Fort Keogh in Miles City, Montana, where he served as a research geneticist and led the Line 1 Hereford breeding program. He retired in 2011 from ARS and founded Delta G. Uh, a private company that continues to work in quantitative genetics, statistics, and systems analysis with various breed organizations, private industry, and government organizations, both domestically and internationally. Dr. McNeil has received many awards, uh, continuing service and pioneer awards from BIF and the Rockefeller Prentice Animal Breeding Award um, from the American Society of Animal Science and was recently named a research fellow by that same organization. Uh, he's also an honorary member of the South African Society of Animal Science and disting distinguished alumnus of South Dakota State. So with that, uh, certainly my great pleasure to, to introduce Mike McNeil and to turn it over to you. Thanks, Matt. Well, we'll start with a quiz. If you can identify the breeds on this slide, you're in good shape. You can leave. Um, they represent sort of the diversity of breeds that we find in the world today. And, and with that, uh, we'll move on to, I'm gonna talk about a piece of research. Okay, first thing we gotta do is figure out how to advance the slides, Matt. Um, so in the, the bottom left, there should be arrows, otherwise you can use the up or down arrows on your, on your computer. Yeah, I'm mashing the up and down arrows and that's not doing anything. Uh, there we go. Um, so if we do that, I'm going to talk about a little piece of research that I did with Fernando Cardosa and Alhamidi Hay um, using data from the Line 1 Hereford cattle, looking at genotype by environment interaction effects, um, primarily for pre-weaning traits. We've known for quite a while, at least, at least since the, the late 1970s, the genotype by environment interaction did exist in our um, beef populations, and it's been argued at least that maybe we ought to consider those in performance testing, the exchange of seed stock across regional boundaries and sourcing of semen, and so on. Um, Dave Nodder and Dave Buchanan um, in some work fairly early on suggested that maybe we ought to be accounting for these things in our evaluation of weaning weight. Um, 
Fernando Cardosa and Rob Templeman in Fernando's PhD work really looked fairly seriously at the use of reaction norms for the study of G by E in, in livestock, although the original, the original suggestion comes from work by Douglas Faulkner back around 1990. For those of you who are not familiar, this is a, a little brief, quick introduction to line one. Line one was founded in 1934 with 50 cows that were unrelated to two half sieve bulls and has been maintained since that time as an inbred line. Selection within the line has been primarily for growth to one year of age. Um, and in the data set that I'm going to talk about today, there's phenotypes from a little over 7,500 animals, plus an additional nearly 2,000 ancestral pedigree records. The, the top of the blue bars in this graph would represent the genetic trend for yearling weight over the course of this almost 20 generations now of a, of a selection experiment. The, dot, the, the line above that relates to the right-hand axis and shows the percentage of inbreeding through the, the time that transpired since the founding of the population with those two half bulls. For those of you who have not been to eastern Montana, this is Fort Keogh, um, outlined in the, in the sort of green shaded box. It's directly adjacent to the town of Mile City. 22,500 hectares of semi-arid mixed curry grassland that has never been broken for the most part. Um, it's a mixture of cool season and warm season grasses with various annual bromes invading in the past 35 or 40 years. It's a land of extremes in, in terms of climate, weather. Um, annual precipitation is fairly sparse relative to what most would be familiar with, somewhere is 12 and a half inches per year. Although this year we'd be grateful for 12 and a half. Um, management of the cattle, beginning around the 1st of January, um, there'd be some supplementation with energy and protein, um, and hay provided if snow prevented grazing. That's not an annual event that snow prevents grazing, but in some years it does. Mid-March or so, cattle are moved to calving pastures to facilitate data collection and calving at two years of age started in 1977. The data set that we're looking at is almost 2,400 cows, and on average, cows handle 3.2 calves. Uh, 45 to 60 day breeding season that has moved closer to spring over time, uh, presently starts around the 1st of June. Weaning has been almost constant at, at approximately an average age of 180 days. The, the main change in the selection procedure was in the, in the early years, castration of some calves, some of the calves that were deemed inferior occurred around weaning, whereas now all the, all the bulls are carried through to year of age. Um, for those of you whose eyes glaze over at matrix algebra, this is the statistical model that's, that's used in this analysis. So, and we're analyzing weaning weight, or from birth to weaning, rather. Uh, there's a year effect. There's a sex age of dam subclass effect. There's regressions on both inbreeding of calf and inbreeding of dam. And then there are direct and maternal genetic effects and a permanent environmental effect that are associated with each calf's record and a random error to account for the noise. 
the expectation of the variance components are given in the, in the next two matrices. So we assume years are independently distributed with some common variance, sigma squared y. We assume the genetic variances are distributed with variance covariance structure G, which is articulated below, and I'll cover in a minute. Uh, permanent environmental effects are independent and associated with the dam of the calf, and error applies to each calf independently. The, the G matrix is a little different than what you're used to seeing for national cattle evaluation in that there are two terms for direct effect and two terms for maternal effect. Um, the first, the subscripts one and two relate to the direct effect. The first one is the typical direct effect on weaning weight. And the second term is the regression on the random year effect. So we have a, a, a regression, an EPD for the regression on year effect. And then the maternal effects are subscripted three and four. And again, the typical constant maternal effect and a maternal effect that is a function of the year effects. We did this with a we did this analysis using a Bayesian approach with 110,000 samples. Uh, threw away the first 10,000 as burn-in for the MCMC chain, and then thinned that chain to every 25th sample. This is the beginnings of the results, if you will, and and so I've I've got this slide organized where the environmental effect is actually the year effect. And I've classified those year effects as the fifth percentile, that is a, a bad year, the 50th percentile, which in terms of the year effects is the middle of the distribution, and the 95th percentile, which is reflects a very good year. And what we in fact saw was the direct effect heritabilities changed a fair bit across that environmental array. Maternal effect heritabilities were much more constant. Would point out that the correlation between direct and maternal effects in these data analyzed this way was zero. Now when I analyzed it previously with just constant direct effects and constant maternal effects, that correlates, that same correlation was zero, or was not zero, it was negative. Um, to summarize the data in, in one way at least, if I, if I correlate the breeding values for direct effect from the fifth percentile with the breeding values from the 95th percentile, the direct effect correlation of those breeding values is 0.67. That number is low enough that it suggests to me at least that we might be dealing with two different traits across that array of environmental effects. The maternal effect, the, the rank or the correlation between the breeding values for maternal effects is much more nearly constant. And, and I'll be honest, when I started doing this analysis before I'd ever seen a result, I expected this result to be the opposite. And so I was a little surprised by this. So these are the genetic trends. This is the trend for direct effect. The red line in the middle is the typical year, the average year. The green and blue lines reflect the good years and, and poor years. And what we can see is that the trend in the good years is actually a little slower than the trend in the poor years, and, and the average year is intermediate to that. Maternal effects, the trends lay more or less one on top of the other. This is the trend, these are the trends then in the sensitivity to the environment. And we see that the trend for direct effect is basically downward 
except for this little bit right at the beginning. And the trend for maternal effect is pretty much positive. The fact that the direct effect trend is downward suggests the environment limits the expression of direct effect, and the positive slope for the maternal effect suggests the environment is actually adequate for the expression of maternal genetic effect, milk production, if you will, um, at Mile City. And I think biologically I can explain this a little better in a, in a couple of slides. Actually, it's the next slide. So this slide, let me orient you to this. Um, calving's back over here toward the, toward the y-axis, which is crude protein percentage of the forage from some data that was collected by the range scientists over a number of years. The, this, this line that slopes downward gently is the protein requirement for the calf. Um, if you were to put the protein requirement for the cow, it would kind of follow the protein requirement for the calf, but would be just a titch lower than that. This vertical line represents the end of the growing season. So, so the green up of forage occurs back here someplace in, the, in sort of May. And senescence, the, the end of the growing season, senescence occurs out here um, from early August to the to weaning in October relative to the to the calf situation. And what we can what we in fact see is for at least part of the period and a substantial part of the period, the protein content of the forage would exceed the requirements of the cow and the calf. Now bear in mind that also in this early period, this is when the calf is largely dependent on the cow for its diet, milk production. If we move to later in the season, as the calf is weaning itself from mom and becoming more reliant on forage, the protein requirements lower, and this calf is probably actually in a situation where it where it's protein content of its diet may be limiting its ability to express its true growth potential. And I think that's why those environmental sensitivity pieces follow along the way they do, negative for the calf's growth, direct effect, and positive for the maternal effect. So in, in conclusion, uh, we showed pretty, pretty conclusively, if you will, that the genotype environment interaction did influence the genetic evaluation of line one cattle in the mild city environment for the trait gained from birth to weaning. And I would like to suggest that the contemporary group solutions that we do, that we obtain from national cattle evaluation may be useful in the way that we model effects model the genetic effects for further national cattle evaluation. If we're looking at genetic trend, we get better estimates of the trend if we consider G by E. If herd effects are repeatable, and I don't know the answer to that, then breeders might actually improve their selection decisions if they use those effects to modify the EPDs that they presently see in, in a way that made them a better fit to their herd. And with that, Matt, I'm going to kick this back over to you. I've got a couple of minutes for questions, actually somewhere is five to ten, and we can go on from there. Thank you. No, sounds great. Thank you, Mike. Um, and, and Jared, you can actually go ahead and, and take control now and you can be loading as, as we're wrapping up with Mike. Uh, if anyone has questions, you can type those in the chat box for either of our speakers. I know Mike is, is going to have to leave here in about five minutes, so he won't be around at the conclusion. But if you think of questions later on, I'm sure he would uh, be willing to, to receive an email from you uh, about that. 
What, one question I have, Mike, while we're waiting to see if anyone has questions, is um, how E might be defined in an NCE scenario. So really my question is, how refined of a definition do we need for environment? I, my preference right now, Matt, is that we would use some piece of the contemporary group solution. Okay. So, so maybe, maybe it's herd year, maybe, or, or we get herd variances that are separate. Um, and if, if those herd effects are repeatable, then we could, we could actually tailor E to specific herds. So we could give you a, a, an EPD that was specific to your herd. That's a, that's a little different approach than most of the G by E studies have used in the past, where we've tried to cut the country up into regions or used weather patterns or whatever, but, but certainly not been down at the level of resolution of individual herds. And, and maybe, maybe one other final question for you. If we assume a, a multi-breed evaluation of some kind, and that multi-breed evaluation uses a common additive, additive genetic variance, um, but doesn't allow for heterogeneity there between breeds, does, does that create in your mind any complications then um, as you move to a, a model that might uh, contemplate G by E? Well, just when you, when you say the words multi-breed, you already have created complications. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I guess, Matt, I'm, I'm going to beg off on the question because I don't know the answer to that. We've been playing around with animal models in one way or another for how many years? Almost 30 for, for individual breeds, animal, oh. 30 years, roughly. And, you know, we, we've come to understand those pretty well. I'm not sure we've achieved yet the same level of understanding for the multi-breed evaluation. I, there's a, a question from Mati Sachi that says we may consider herd as a repeatable uh, variable to consider in NCE, but how about the year effect? How do we know about the future year effect? We don't, Mati. I mean, I mean, I, weather forecasters can't get the weather right from one year to the next. There, part, part of the year effect, though, would be embedded, if you will, in the herd effect because the, the general climatic condition of that herd isn't, isn't going to change. But, but the year effect is still going to be a, a random thing that we, we, that we really can't account for. And I think that relates to another question that came in is, how do you account for environmental differences from year to year in example drought? And I, I think that would be the same answer. Yeah. I mean, I mean, historically looking back in terms of estimating genetic trend, we could, we could account for that. Looking forward in terms of predicting the value of that animal for future progeny, we're not, we're not going to, I don't think we're going to deal with your effects very well. Good. Well, thank you again, Mike. I don't see any other questions, but uh, greatly appreciate the time you spent with us here today. Okay, you're welcome. Um, you can, you can, if there's more questions later, you can forward those on to me, Matt, and I'll try to address them. Will do. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll transition over to our second speaker of the day, Dr. Jared Decker from the University of Missouri. Uh, he's an assistant professor in the animal science division there and uh, beef genetics extension specialist. He received his bachelor's degree from New Mexico State um, and uh, majored in animal science with a minor in biology there. 
Uh, and then he earned a PhD at the University of Missouri in genetics with a, a minor in statistics. He grew up on a small farm in Northwest New Mexico where his family raised registered cattle. And now he owns a small farm in uh, middle Missouri. Uh, and really the impetus there is to teach his kids the value of hard work. Uh, so he works with stakeholders in the beef industry to better understand rapidly changing genetic technologies and his research focuses on understanding the history of cattle breeds and improving both the cost and accuracy of genomic tests. Jared, as many of you may be aware, is very active on social media and his website, uh, A Stake in Genomics, is often a very good place to, to receive timely updates uh, about te technological advances. So with that, Jared, I'll turn it over to you so you can tell us a little bit about uh, the USDA funded project you have focused on local genetic adaptation. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate that, uh, that introduction. So as Matt mentioned, I, I got hired on faculty at the University of Missouri and then uh, bought a small farm. And so I brought some cattle from, from New Mexico to Missouri. And so the last four years, um, I've learned a lot about local adaptation in cattle. Uh, very few of those cattle that I've brought from New Mexico to Missouri have actually been successful. Uh, this cow that I have a picture of here uh, was was really the worst case scenario. She came to my place uh, with a body condition score of around four, maybe four and a half. Uh, when uh, I weaned her calf and hauled her to the sale barn, um, she was probably easily a body condition score two. And so she was surrounded by, by green grass, uh, but because of the effects of fescue toxicosis, um, she simply continued to, to lose weight. And so I've become very interested in this idea of, of local adaptation, uh, very interested in approaches um, like Dr. McNeil uh, just talked about. Uh, so, so we were able to secure funding from the USDA to look at these things. Um, I've, I've given some updates and, and some overviews of the project previously. Uh, this summer, I gave an overview at BIF. If you're really interested in the research side of this grant, I would suggest that you pull up that uh, BIF 2017 newsroom and find my PowerPoint slides there and, and go through those. Basically, what the purpose of this grant is all about is trying to create tools for cattlemen to match that cow's genetics to her environment. So when we're making those selection decisions, uh, we're making those decisions on, on genomic and genetic predictions that are, in ta that are tailored to the stresses of that environment. And one of the things that my group has had success with is we can really improve the genomic prediction if we make sure we get the right SNPs, the, the most informative SNPs into that genomic prediction. Here's the objectives of the project. Uh, the first objective is really about looking at the history of cattle here in the United States and looking for uh, in the DNA signatures of selection that make certain lines of cattle within a breed uh, more adapted to different regions of the US. And so we're really looking in that DNA for those signatures of local adaptation and that selection for local adaptation. Then uh, in the second objective, we do work to try to uh, better understand gene by environment interactions from a genome wide association study type framework. And then we take those variants, the ones that were under selection, and also those variants that have uh, gene by environment effects, and we create region-specific genomic predictions. What I'm going to spend some time talking to you all about today is this third objective of the grant of educating the next generation of beef producers to fully embrace and properly use animal breeding tools. 
So one of the things that has kind of prevailed when we think about educating producers or when we think about educating students is this deficit model. Really, people are just lacking information. And if we poured more information into their minds, they would get on board and, and start doing the things that we're trying to do. And that model of, of education really hasn't been successful and, and it's really hit some roadblocks. And so this is the model that we uh, propose to use in our grant. It's called the Unified Theory of Acceptance and Use of Technology. And so basically what we have is these different factors that influence the, the behavior uh, intention and then actually using the, the new technology. And all of these things are modified by things like gender, age, experience, voluntariness of use. So performance expectancy, um, does the person expect this new technology to work? Effort expendency is how hard is this new technology to use? Is it simple to use, hard to use? Uh, social influence is pretty straightforward. And then other facilitating conditions that might be influencing the adoption of technology. So in our educational programs in this grant, we really try to focus more on this uh, adoption and use of uh, technology theory. So I'm gonna talk about uh, our undergraduate beef curriculum. Um, if any of you are associated with institutions that could pick up and start to use an applied beef breeding curriculum, uh, we'll talk a little bit later about how you can get early access to this curriculum. This curriculum, we have tried to make it a very applied curriculum, very much real world, um, what is happening on the ground in terms of, of beef cattle breeding. Uh, this part of the project is being led by Dr. Michael Gonda at South Dakota State. Uh, Christy Kamak is also helping with it and Amy Abrams has uh, done a lot of the heavy lifting as graduate students often do. So the goal of this is to create a, a genetics undergrad curriculum and, and it comes with various different pieces. Uh, the, to break those objectives out, basically we're looking at beef production scenarios and breeding objectives, how to correctly use those EPDs, indexes, and DNA tests, uh, using the available information correctly, so trying to avoid double counting and some of those other bad habits we have in the beef industry, uh, using crossbreeding to accomplish goals, um, helping the students to be well informed about new and emerging technologies and have a positive attitude towards those, and then trying to get some social influence going through the use of social media. This is kind of how the various weeks of the course break out, um, kind of build from the ground up. They weren't super excited about the coat color genetics. So if we look at ebeef.org, that's one of our most commonly uh, viewed fact sheets. But here in the context of this course, they didn't love it. Um, they did really love um, application to real world. So asking them to evaluate a family farm or, or some other herd, uh, really trying to have applied problem-based um, material. The students really appreciated that. Um, this is kind of how it's going forward. They're, they're uh, continuing the, they, so they had the first course taught the summer of 2017. Now they're evaluating that course and um, further refining it. And then in the spring, uh, they'll start getting the word out about it. And uh, in 2018, it'll be taught not only at SDSU, but at cooperating universities. So if you're interested or, or you know an instructor that might be interested in getting access to these materials, um, have them get in touch with Michael Gonda. But the plan is to have all of these curriculum uh, available on a website and and available for beef producers and excuse me for beef instructors to use as a resource 
We are also going to be developing a, a curriculum very similar to this undergraduate curriculum. That'll be a youth curriculum for, for 4-H and FFA uh, instruction. But one of the things that uh, John Tummins, who's here in Ag Ed at the University of Missouri, uh, wanted to really get a handle on is what are the current attitudes in the beef industry uh, towards uh, genetics and, and genomics? And, and so he kind of led uh, creating a, a beef producer survey. Basically, what we were trying to get at is where are they getting their information? To what extent are they using that genetic information to make decisions? Um, where are they putting the priorities in terms of that genetic information? Uh, how do they learn about new genetic technologies or, or breeding technologies? And then what roadblocks are really uh, in their way in terms of using this technology more? Right now, our sample size is small enough that it really isn't a probabilistic sample, but we're going to be collecting more in-person uh, surveys this fall to really bump up those numbers and try to get it to a point where we do have that probabilistic probabilistic sample, focusing on seed stock and, and commercial cow-calf producers, um, and, and just trying to get in, in front of people at, at various uh, places, uh, really for the in-person uh, last spring and, and this fall, we're really focusing on those cow sales. So right now we, we have uh, a little over 100 in-person surveys. Uh, we hope to get that up to, uh, I, I believe the number's 250, um, might be higher than that. But, but we've got a lot more data collecting to do this fall. And then we've had fairly good response on the online version, uh, but the online version may be a little bit biased towards those people who are uh, internet, uh, savvy internet users in, in the first place. Just give you a taste of some of the results we've seen from this. Um, basically, the, the things that we would expect to come to the top do come to the top. Uh, producers, whether they're purebred or cow-calf, really rely on that visual inspection. Uh, the, the seed stock producers are much more, uh, tend to use the EPDs where the cow-calf producer is, is either relying on, on a breeder who they trust or, or some other um, trusted advisor. And, and also the rank of the genomic test is, is different between these two groups. You know, how are they getting that information? The purebred breeders are really relying on their breed associations. Uh, the cow-calf producer is really relying on those trade publications. Um, kind of when we presented this to our advisory board, they were troubled a little bit by how low ranked veterinarians were because they had ranked higher in previous surveys of this type. And uh, some of the extension agents in the room were also troubled by um, th th their ranking on this list as well. Um, I think it just really if, if these results are valid, I think it just really highlights that, that we need to really be aggressive about having an impact as uh, extension specialists and extension educators. We had a, an essay contest. We've got uh, uh, 29 essays and, and we'll be judging those soon to get the, the results out. And then we'll be doing our second round of these essay contests in spring of 2018. So if you know any juniors, whether they're 4-H, FFA, breed, Junior Breed Association members, uh, have them watch out for this essay contest. Um, we were able to get some sponsorship support and have uh, some really nice prizes, cash prizes for these essays. This is really just trying to find another lever, lever to get that information out and uh, using an audience that you know maybe maybe grandpa is more uh, willing to listen to information if it comes from uh, his granddaughter. So let's talk a little bit about 
the genomic analyses that we do have planned or, or are in the process of completing for this project. One of the things that uh, we said we were going to do in this project is instead of just looking at the, the 50,000 SNPs or the 70,000 uh, SNPs DNA markers that we typically use in, in cattle evaluation and, and genomic prediction, we really wanted to use uh, tens of millions of SNPs. And so to be able to look at tens of millions of SNPs, we really need the reference genome to be as accurate as possible. And so one of the things that's been happening over the last uh, 18 months is they've been rebuilding the reference genome assembly. And so they've generated what we call PAC bio data. It's very long sequences. Instead of being uh, 900 base pairs in length or 100 base pairs in length, this PAC bio data is, is extremely long, can be tens of thousands of base pairs in length, and it's really nice to assemble a genome. Um, they initially uh, submitted the genome. Uh, they, they did a whole lot of looking for errors and trying to fix problems with the, this new reference genome. Uh, they submitted it to NCBI, the uh, database for these type of genomes back in June. In July, they realized that uh, they were missing about 6 million base pairs out of the, the 2.5 seven billion base pairs of DNA. And so now they've just been going through and making sure they can get those six million base pairs back into the new reference. And so we've kind of been a little bit in a holding pattern waiting for this new uh, reference genome to be available to make sure we can do what we call imputation as most accurately as possible. And so that's held up some of our genomic analyses. Uh, we have uh, created uh, automated pipelines so we can just click a button and run the analysis. So once we have that resource in place in terms of the reference genome, we'll be able to analyze this data quite rapidly. This is kind of the 30,000 foot level of, of how we typically analyze data um, at uh, the University of Missouri. And so we have a lot of uh, practices and, and pipelines in place to make sure that we analyze this data in a very repeatable and accurate way. So we get genotypes either from uh, one of the genotyping companies or through a data transfer agreement from a breed association. It comes into our genotype database. We can then estimate breed composition of those samples and do the SNP processing. Then we can do what we call imputation. Uh, and then we can feed that into our other genome-wide analyses. We've got lots of uh, whole genome resequencing data that comes in, whether that's uh, genomic data, RNA data, or, or other types of data. And we can kind of combine all of these. Uh, so instead of looking at those 50,000 SNPs, we're looking at, at 10 million SNPs. But most of this process has already been um, automated or is in the process of being automated. So it's simply uh, just turnkey. So let's talk about imputation. Uh, what is the process of, of imputation? So here I've got a sentence and it's missing a few words. Um, if, you, if you try to figure out what this sentence is saying, uh, there's probably a pretty good chance that some of you can either figure out the entire sentence or can figure out several of the words. So just as your mind can figure out using the patterns that are available, what the missing data is, we have software available that can take the genotype markers and using those patterns, identify what the genotypes are of, of ungenotyped variants. So, so we can fill in that missing information and that allows us to go from those 50,000 SNPs up to the 10 million SNPs. And for a long time in beef cattle breeding, we've talked about heterosis and crossbreeding kind of being the only free lunch that we have in the beef industry. I think this process of imputation really is, is a free lunch with um, 
some some software we can genotype an animal at a much lower density and based on the pattern of of those genotypes get data on a much larger number of of dna markers so really what this allows us to do and in, instead of having to spend thousands of dollars trying to sequence more and more animals we can get millions of, of DNA variant information through this process of imputation. And, and really, we want that increased resolution. We, we want to get down not to just a, a, a big chunk of DNA that somewhere in there uh, contains the important information, but we want to get as close to the actual point of interest as, as possible when we are discovering those DNA variants and looking for those associations. So we've done some testing of this. That's been one of the things that we've really worked on uh, this first 18 months of the project is trying to get this imputation right. And, and so what we've had the best luck with is, is using Eagle to phase all of those genotypes at the same time. And then we impute up using a software called uh, Impute2. And so if we were just taking uh, common SNPs, say 20,000 common SNPs and imputing up to 50,000 common SNPs, um, the, the, the correlation between the true and the imputed genotypes would be much higher, would be close to, you know, 96, 99 percent. Here we're going from, you know, 50,000 variants up to 10 million variants. So the uh, accuracy of those imputation tends to be lower. It tends to be lower, especially when when those variants are less ac uh, less common, have lower minor allele frequencies. But we still feel that we can do this uh, quite accurately and and get some valuable information out of these variants. Changing gears a little bit, one of the, the areas of the project that we've been quite active in, in in the beginning part of this project has been looking at hair shedding scores. So up here on the top, I have pictures of, of various cows. These are courtesy of Trent Smith at Mississippi State. So this cow over here on the left, uh, this is the beginning of the summer, the end of the spring, and she still has nearly 100% of her old dead winter hair. And as we move to the right, we get to this cow over here that she shed off 100% of her winter hair. She's nice and slick, uh, doesn't have any of that, that winter coat on anymore. Uh, a, a score of three is for an animal that shed off about 50%. Uh, two is, is shed off about 75%. And, and a four, she's uh, only shed off about 25%. They tend to shed off from the front to the back and from the top to the bottom. So you'll notice these cows tend to have less hair uh, on their necks and, and kind of this uh, cow that has a score of a two. She's got a little bit of that winter coat back here on, on her lower one third and on her high end quarter. What the initial uh, results from this have said is, is that those earlier shedding cows tend to wean a calf that's about 24 pounds heavier uh, at weaning time. So there's some articles about this uh, part of the project that you can find on the web. Uh, this is from our, one of our research centers uh, at the University of Missouri. And so you'll see we have very few ones, very few fives, and it's kind of normally distributed data where we see a lot of threes, a lot of twos, and a lot of fours. If we look at just the two and three year old cows, um, we've got small numbers here that have ones and, and fives. There's something strange going on there. Um, perhaps those um, cows who, who don't milk very much, uh, they put more of their nutrition towards themselves. And so they're able to shed off earlier, but their calf doesn't grow. Whereas those cows that uh, are milking a little bit harder um, aren't putting as much energy into themselves, so they're not shedding off. So these on the end are a little uh, peculiar, but if we do a regression on all of these scores, what we see is if we use adjusted weaning weight is that uh, those cows that had a 
hair shedding score of two tended to wean a calf that was 10 pounds heavier than one that scored a four. If we look at just the, the raw weaning weight, um, the, the, the difference is even larger. And so what this is telling me is that those earlier shedding cows uh, tend to also get bred earlier in the breeding season so that they have an older calf at weaning time. In 2016, we recruited and collected data from about 7,000 animals, um, mostly cows in this project. This year, we've added about uh, 1,800 animals. And so now we're up about uh, 8,500 animals that have been enrolled in the project. We required herds to uh, report scores on their whole herd. So we required whole herd reporting. And we're genotyping those animals um, as we get those data collected. Uh, in some other analyses that I'll talk about here in a minute, we've divided the US up into nine different regions. And so most of our hair shedding scores have come from here in Missouri. Uh, we've got quite a bit in what I would call the fescue belt and, and some additional ones in the south and then few others at, at other regions. Uh, that was kind of on purpose is to focus this southeast portion of the US uh, just because that's where we kind of struggle the most with heat and especially humidity. If we, we asked producers if their cows were grazing on fescue and we had about 5,000 of those 8,000 cows that are uh, grazing fescue uh, sometime in the spring prior to collecting those hair shedding scores. So we might be able to do some gene by environment um, genome wide association studies where we treat the environment about whether or not those cows uh, were grazed on fescue and look for um, re-ranking of, of SNP, SNP effects based on whether or not the cow grazed fescue. This is the breakdown of the breeds. Um, obviously got a lot of uh, Black Angus data, uh, got several from Semmental and Hereford as well. Uh, with the other breeds kind of represented here. Um, we, we've really been happy with, with our ability to recruit cattle and producers uh, into that project. And part of the way we've done that is we really tried to create a win-win situation. So what we asked is that the registered um, cattle breeder turn in a DNA sample and a phenotype to us at the University of Missouri using those uh, USDA grant funds. We paid for the genotyping of those animals. We then uh, made arrangements with the breed associations to turn those genotypes. Uh, so that included parentage markers, um, molecular breeding values, and the actual raw genotypes over to those breed associations. And then the breed association uh, gives the registered breeder basically a free genomic enhanced DPD. Um, so I think this has been a real win-win for um, all of the parties involved. There was a, quite a learning curve for all of the parties involved, um, but I think it's, it's worked out in the end. Uh, just to kind of wrap up here, we, we take uh, precipitation data, temperature data, and elevation data. We do a statistical analysis of all of these data, and we're able to split the United States up into these nine different regions. At our advisory board meeting, uh, Mike McNeil had talked about um, cows that had left the, the Fort Keogh uh, USDA station there at Miles City and, and went uh, across the state of Montana to a different ranch, and those cows gaining 200 pounds. Well, uh, those two ranches, the, the USDA center and, and, and the other ranch, they were in different climate zones um, in our map. So uh, we really feel like uh, we're accurately describing these different climates and, and environments that we have in, here in the United States. And so basically what we're looking at when we're looking at these signatures of selection is we create a genome-wide tree uh, of genetic distances and then we do it for each individual variant. So we'll do this 
10 million times for each variant that we have, DNA variant that we have information on. And if a variant is under selection, we see that that variant has, an, has a longer than expected genetic distance, meaning that selection has caused the frequency of that DNA variant to diverge more than expected. And so this is kind of the distribution of some Semitol data we've been working with. Uh, that's the genetic tree. Basically, we're able to find two very significant signatures of selection and some others that are possibly suggestive. These DNA variants will be the one that go into our genomic prediction. And basically what the point of this is, is, is kind of uh, an approach to create in region specific uh, genomic predictions and allowing those gene by environment interactions to allow cattle to uh, re-rank. And so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions you all may have. Great, thanks, Jared. And I'd remind the group to, to type their questions into the chat box. We do have one question in, Jared, and it's asking how well does imputation work for composite breeds? Um, so, so it 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 should work um, quite well. Uh, so basically, what happens in uh, that composite breed is you actually end up with uh, longer, um, more different haplotypes. So, so let's say we're, we're talking about Brangus, um, just to pull out an example. We'll have Angus haplotypes in that Brangus population, and we'll have uh, Zebu, Brahmin, or Nalore haplotypes in that population as well. And so, um, those haplotypes will have had less time to be chopped up by recombination and they'll be much different from one another. So imputation, being able to phase uh, the data, so it, uh, assign one of the two alleles at a SNP to a particular haplotype, whether it was the maternal haplotype or the paternal paternal haplotype um, should be easier and then using that phasing information to impute missing data um, should work quite well. Um, now we haven't done any testing of that here um, with our data. We've been focusing on Holstein data and Angus data that we have um, some nice well-structured data sets on, um, but just based on first principles that imputation should work pretty well. Great, thanks, Jared. Well, I wanna remind the group, oh, I think we've got another question here. Um, will Boss Indicus composite breeds be included in future hair shedding data collection research? Th that, would, that would definitely be something that I would be interested in. Uh, the key would be finding the uh, getting getting funding to actually do that research. So uh, that wasn't the focus of this current grant, um, just because you know the use of those um, Boss Indicus influenced cattle. That's kind of by including that Boss Indicus uh, ancestry is kind of the source of that adaptation to the heat and humidity. Um, so what we were trying to do here is for those boss Taurus cattle to give them tools to, to add um, selection pressure for local adaptation. Great. Just as an FYI, Jared, it was Tommy Perkins at, at Brangus that asked that question. So you might follow up with him or he might follow up with you. Okay, I'd like to, to remind the group about our, our upcoming third session, which will be on October 18th at noon central, where we'll focus on new type trait EPDs. Your host will be Dare Bullock from the University of Kentucky, and we'll have two speakers. One, Dr. Bob Weber from Kansas State, who will talk about some research uh, that he's uh, led there focused on uh, genetic parameter estimation for feet and leg structure in cattle. And then the, the second uh, speaker will be uh, Heather Bradford at the University of Georgia, who will talk about some work she did actually when she was at Kansas State under the direction of uh, Dan Mosier, and we'll talk about teeter and teat and utter score uh, EPDs. 
Uh, so I encourage you guys to uh, tap in next week uh, to hear those two talks. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for their participation today and encourage uh, you guys uh, uh, to tap in for the remaining talks during this session and look forward to seeing you online next week. Thank you.